The first Sunday in November, this November, will mark 39 years that I have been working as a full-time minister. Nothing compared to Dayton. I think he's been doing, what, 84 years now? <laughs> Something like that. We're not competing. Well, I say this because in that amount of time, you begin to recognize some patterns that are common from church to church. Some things are different, but some things are the same. Wherever you go, I've preached in you know, California and here and in Canada and different provinces, always the, some things never change from place to place. Each congregation has its own strengths and weaknesses, each has its own personality, but all of them seem to share one particular trait without exception, and that is the constant struggle to maintain good attendance for worship, and of course Choctaw is no exception to that. For this reason, I have compiled the 10 most common reasons why people do not come to church. Here they are, the top 10. Number 10, I'm Jewish. <laughs> I can stop here and be ahead of the game, right? <laughs> Obviously, the main reason why people don't attend worship is that they're not Christians. Seriously, 68% of the world population never heard of Christ. That's pretty sobering, isn't it? The number of believers that we have today is the same as we had in 1830, but the world population has tripled. This is why the Great Commission is still in force today. I mean no disrespect to doctors, lawyers, accountants, teachers, plumbers, uh, carpenters, oil workers, truck drivers. I mean no disrespect. But the world can do without one more lawyer, but it needs every single preacher that it can get. Yeah. Amen. Reason number nine, I'm sick. I'm not coming to church because I'm sick. Each week a number will be sick, and this is normal. This is part of our ministry, to pray for and to visit and to help the sick, James 5.19. Didn't Johnny, one of our elders, pray for people who were sick? Many of whom were members of this congregation, and they're not here. We try to minister to them, our elders do, and you know, we stream our services so they can at least participate from home. But you know, it happens all the time. People are sick. 10% of the congregation is not here because they're sick for some reason or other. Top 10 reasons, number eight, I'm changing. I'm in transition. You know, life is a continual process of change. Moving, going to college, getting married, having babies, new jobs, more babies, retirement. With these changes come interruptions in our routines and habits. One habit that suffers during a period of change is usually church attendance. You know, it goes something like this. Well, I'll start searching for a new congregation next week or, well, wait a minute, after the house closes or when things settle down, that'll be a better time to go look for a new church. You know, and we keep putting it off and putting it off and putting it off. Coming to worship and Bible study often gets packed away with other things that we promise ourselves to sort out once we get settled. But many times this habit, this feature of our old life never gets unpacked and it remains stored away with the family albums and the old tennis rackets. I'm not coming to church because I'm working, I'm working. This is particular to Oklahoma where most people have two jobs. Everybody's got two jobs. Everybody's got their main job and they got their side job. Everybody's got a sideline going. Folks here work long hours. You know, there was a time in this uh, when industry and government recognized that this was basically a Christian nation and working on Sundays or irregular shifts was less prevalent, but now it's the norm. Now you know, your boss doesn't care that you go to church on Sunday. You know, he, he normally won't make exceptions for you if you work, have to work on Sunday and miss church. 
Today we live in a multiracial, multi-religious, heavily indebted society where people accommodate schedules and not the other way around. The Bible says that to provide for our families should be a priority. I'll read the scripture, 1 Timothy 5.8, but if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So it's important as Christians that we provide for our families. It's simply unfortunate that our fast paced and extremely materialistic society requires that we sacrifice our spiritual lives in order to meet the demands of our lifestyles. That's just the way it is. I'm not coming to church because I'm new. I'm new. You know, one of the most embarrassing moments for the minister is announcing the good news that we have a new brother or sister in Christ recently baptized and we ask them to stand and then there's this awkward moment you know, while people are craning their necks to get a look at this new Christian, but they're not at worship service. We forgot to teach him about that thing. You know, oh yeah, and by the way, we're expecting you to be at worship on, on Sunday and Wednesday. The scene repeats itself you know, at the Wednesday service as well. Young Christians may know about the gospel and the way and the reasons why they came to Christ. This is important, but young Christians also need to be trained in Christian living and be taught about the rewards of regular attendance with the saints for study and fellowship and worship. That's part of the teaching. Paul tells us that the only way to strengthen faith is by continually hearing God's word, Romans 10, Romans 10 verse 17. He says in 2 Timothy 3.16 that the study and sharing of God's word is what trains an individual in Christian wisdom and service. And we just don't hear the word at work. You know, if we're at the shop or at the office or on the, on the floor or wherever, they don't stop, they don't take a break and say, okay, everybody stop working. We're going to have a moment of reflection. Uh, the Bible verse for today is, they don't do that at work. You don't, have, you don't hear the word being preached at work. You come here for that. In most cases, this valuable experience is only gained through regular attendance at church services. Coming to services each Sunday, making time for Bible study each Wednesday is an acquired habit developed by the encouragement and example of other Christians. Hopefully it's our parents that teach us this. Being faithful in attendance isn't hardwired in at baptism. It comes with patient repetition under all kinds of circumstances. I was baptized and it was a sunny day. Whoops, Sunday comes around, it's raining. And it's raining hard. Should I not go to church? Is that an excuse? Should try living in Montreal. We didn't cancel church when there was 10 inches of snow that fell on Saturday night. You, you made it in somehow. I'm not coming to church because I'm busy. I'm just a busy person. You know, there's a difference between I'm working and I'm busy. One is based on need and the other is based on want. The busy person is not a bad person. They're just busy. In Mark 4, 18 and 19, Jesus describes this person in his parable of the sower and the seed. We read, he says, and others are the ones on whom seed was sown among the thorns. These are the ones who have heard the word, but the worries of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. Who's he talking about? Well, he's talking about the busy guy. Do you recognize this person? Very busy, concerned with problems that are strictly rooted in this world. We're not saying they're illegitimate problems. We're just saying busy, concerned with the problems in this world. Very busy getting ahead in this world. Very busy securing and defending his place in this world. This person is not evil, but this person has a priority problem. He or she allows what's urgent, what's here and now, to take precedent over what is truly important, perhaps unseen, 
but nevertheless important. Busy people have forgotten or don't realize or don't believe the most basic principle of Christian living. If we put kingdom matters, like faithful attendance, for example, if we put things like this first, God will find a way to provide for us all the things we are so busy trying to provide for ourselves and in doing so, putting our souls at risk. I'm not coming to church because I'm hurt. Many people stop coming to worship because they have been hurt in some way. It's unfortunate. Hurt by another member's comments or attitude. Offended by a perceived lack of attention by the elders or the ministers. Angered by some things being done in a way that they disagree with. Offended by a comment or a teaching made by one of the preachers or one of the teachers in the class. Now most times elders or preachers are unaware that the person is offended. And I know that ministers don't sit around trying to figure out ways to offend and run off the, mem the members. You know, we, have a, a <laughs> we have the ministers meet you know, the, on the agenda is, wow, how are we going to get sister so-and-so to get mad at us? <laughs> so she will leave or she'll write us a nasty note. How, what can we do to really get on her nerves? You know, I mean, but it happens. People get their feelings hurt. You can't put 400 sinners together in one room and think that somebody's not going to get their feelings hurt. Now even though the offense may only be perceived and unintended, people do get their feelings hurt in church. And when this happens, it's unfortunate for several reasons. First of all, leaving the church because you've, you're offended will not justify you before God at judgment. Sorry. Jesus specifically warned his disciples that among other things, they would be subjected to persecution, false teachers, sufferings of all kinds, including physical, emotional, and spiritual attack. And then he says that the one who endures until the end will be saved. Mark 13, nine to 23. Think now. Regardless of the offense, real or imagined, leaving the church is not the answer, nor is it something God excuses. I mean, he tells us, you, know, you might have to give up your life for your faith, but if you hang in to the end, you'll be saved. Another reason leaving church is unfortunate. It doesn't solve the problem. Leaving the church because someone or something offends us. Leaving because we've suffered a tragedy or a setback of some kind. This is not going to help us recover. This is not going to make things better. Ignoring God or separating ourselves from our brothers and sisters will not make us healthier spiritually. It will only make us more vulnerable to sin. Jesus tells us what to do when somebody offends us in Matthew 18, 15. It begins with go to that person and tell them what is on your mind. Of all the things we could learn to avoid division in the church, if we could just learn that lesson, somebody says something or does something to offend you, you go to that person. If we could just learn that, oh boy, what a wonderful, experience we would have in our Christian fellowship together. James tells us what to do when we're suffering or we're sad. Ask the church for help and prayer. Don't just go off by yourself in a corner. This is why we offer an invitation at the end of our service in order to take care of these type of things. This is why we have you know, more than one elder. There are other reasons for that, but certainly that's one of them. These men are there to care for the sheep, but they cannot guess what the disease is. They cannot guess what the care is. They cannot guess if one is offended or not. They need to be informed. 
we shouldn't try to punish God or the church for the offenses committed against us. You know what? Better that we turn the other cheek than we turn away from the one who died to save us and the body that he loves. Remember, Jesus loves the church. Another reason why I'm not coming to church, well, I'm just lazy. I'm sorry, we're getting to it now. <laughs> In 39 years, I've only met one person who actually admitted that this was the cause of many of his problems and failure. I, I admired his honesty. He said to me, I'm just lazy, I can't, I can't fight it. <laughs> so I slapped him. No, I didn't do that, <laughs> I didn't. I wanted to, but I repented. Let's face it. Going to church on a regular basis requires physical and mental effort. I mean, think about it. There's preparation and travel. Multiply it if you have young children or are bringing an elderly person who needs help or you live a distance away. You need personal discipline to sit and to listen and to stay focused. There's the extra work involved if you are teaching or serving in some way. And then there's the spiritual effort that comes with the continual adjustments and changes pressed on you by God's word and His Spirit as He molds you into the image and the person of Christ. It's not easy. Now the definition of a lazy person according to the dictionary is as follows. One who dislikes physical or mental effort. Solomon in the book of Proverbs says it this way. The sluggard buries his hand in the dish he is weary of bringing it to his mouth again. <laughs> you like that one, eh? <laughs> too lazy to feed himself. His hand goes into the dish, he's just too lazy to bring it back to his mouth. That's lazy. In other words, the lazy man won't even feed himself. Well, you know what? The lazy man won't even feed himself spiritually either. Why? Because it requires effort. The Lord provides the nourishment for the only part of a person that will live forever, which is the human soul. And yet some people are too lazy to make the physical and mental effort to come to the dinner table each week. I'm not coming to church because I'm worldly. One of the saddest stories in the Bible is the story of Demas, an early disciple in the church. In Colossians 4 verse 14 and Philemon 24, Paul the Apostle counts Demas among his missionary team of helpers and faithful disciples in Christ. In Paul's last letter from Rome before he died, he mentions Demas again, but this time in different terms. He says, for Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Some Christians don't attend regularly because they can't decide who they love more from week to week, Christ or the world. They love the smell of success more than they love the smell of sacrifice. They love the pleasures, the activities, the allurements of this world more than the promises of the next. Jesus spoke of the terrible pull of the world and its power to immobilize us spiritually when He said the following. This is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. When we're involved in sin of some kind, a secret habit, a worldly lifestyle, and we have no desire or intention to let it go, we lose interest in going to the place and being with the people that might expose us and deal with our sin. Worldliness is such an insidious vice because it eats away at our spiritual life quietly and without pain until we're cold and dead in Christ and we don't even realize it until it's too late. Some of us just keep making one concession to the world after another until we're no longer part of the kingdom. The world owns us lock, stock and barrel. Satan's number one attack in this process is to diminish a Christian's exposure to God's word and God's people. And he finds any number of seemingly innocent excuses to make that happen. Eventually, we find ourselves liking night better than we like the light. 
and I'm not coming to church, number one. Well, the number one reason is your reason. Whatever that is, you fill in the blank. It could be any of the above or one I haven't mentioned yet, but it's the number one reason if it keeps you from attending all of the services of this congregation on a regular basis. Perhaps you think you don't have to be here. Maybe you're not convinced that the Lord, not just the preacher, but the Lord actually wants you here. It could be that you think you don't get anything out of church attendance, whatever. The purpose of this lesson is twofold. Like Paul says, you know, he doesn't beat the air for nothing. I don't preach for nothing. Reason number one, if you don't attend all the services regularly, I want you to at least acknowledge to yourself the reason why. And number two, to examine that reason or reasons to see if it is truly a valid excuse for you not to be here every time. If it is valid, then I pray that God strengthen and keep you faithful since you are missing a very important part of your spiritual life. And if it isn't valid, then I hope you'll repent and make some changes in your life and your attitude and your habits so that regular church attendance will become part of your natural lifestyle and an important priority for you personally. Yeah, thank you. I realize that I'm mostly preaching to the choir, really. When I had this sermon, I was thinking, yeah, I'm, there, you're here. <laughs> you're here. And that by your presence here today, you're fulfilling your responsibility to the Lord in worship. And I commend you and I encourage you to be here tonight for our evening service and also on Wednesday evening for our midweek service as well. This type of regular attendance is not just tradition or habit, it's a form of inoculation against the world. We break its hold on us three times per week so that we can maintain a spiritual perspective. Regular church, and I don't just mean Sunday, regular church attendance, Sunday morning, Sunday evening, Wednesday night, whenever we have activities. Regular attendance like this is is like the icebreaker ships in Canada. We don't have them here, we don't need them here. But these ships, they plow the Great Lakes and the seaway constantly in the wintertime. They're breaking up the ice. Because left alone, the ice will form a mass, a solid mass in the St. Lawrence Seaway and in the Great Lakes. No ship will be able to come in or go out. The shipping lanes will be frozen solid. So these icebreakers go up and down the St. Lawrence Seaway and all around the Great Lakes, breaking up the ice. Well, in the same way, attendance at all services stops the world from forming a worldly mass over our hearts and over our conscience, allowing the free flow of spiritual influence and prayer between ourselves and God, that's what we're doing. We're not allowing the world to continually and totally possess us. Now for those who may be here today, but who usually don't attend regularly, please don't be hurt and use this as an excuse not to come back. This message, this medicine, was given to spur you on to greater faithfulness and service, which will only benefit you in the end. If this is your weak area, then today's lesson is an attempt to help you become strong. This congregation will not grow as it should unless each individual member grows in his or her own life first. And the beginning of church growth, the number one step is increased faithfulness among the members that are already here. Amen. So if you're a member here at Choctaw, then decide today that you will make church attendance a priority in your life. And ask yourself this question, if I make church attendance a priority in my life, will God be pleased with me? <laughs> will the Lord Jesus Christ be upset with me because I've made a decision in my heart 
to attend every service of the church. You think the Lord's going to kind of be upset with you because you did that? Think about that for a second. No need to come forward, no need to fill out a card, just make the commitment between yourself and God. He knows your heart, He knows your intention, He also knows the legit reasons why you can't be here as well. We'll know it as we see our numbers grow from week to week, from service to service. If you're not a member of the Lord's Church, then of course we invite you to be added to the body of Christ in repentance and baptism. If you've been visiting with us and would like to be a member and place yourself under, the, uh, under our elders, under their direction, be a part of this congregation, of course, we ask you to come and let us know about that as well as you place membership with us. If you have any need, any type of need of prayer, then please let us know now as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.